Playing the saxophone is depressing. Well, playing saxophones, that is. As an elementary school kid all the way up to high school, I did a little thing called NISMO, New York State School Music Association. Now, every year, NISMO holds music evaluations, and if you do a good job, you get into an all-county band with everyone from your county that auditioned. Now, while this may seem like a marvelous chance to show your stuff, the grueling practice that came along with it diminished my self-confidence and abilities. I would see a saxophone tutor once a week, from fifth grade to about ninth grade. I would sit in the basement, and he would bring out a seven-page level six sonata, which was the highest level of music for Nisma. Then for months on end, I would go home to my tutor, practice every day, sight read, work on my 15 scales, sleep, and repeat. It was daunting. I remember sitting in my room sometimes, practicing and getting so frustrated after playing for three or four hours straight, and then just screaming at the top of my lungs into the saxophone. Most times, playing for so long would give me headaches. I would lose circulation in my arms, my back was screwed up, and my hands and clothes were soaking wet from the amount of spit that came out of my saxophone that the sax could no longer hold. I've always been hard on myself, ask anyone, so even though I would cry and scream, I would get a 98 or 99 on every evaluation. I did all county five times straight on both alto and tenor saxophone. I also played a baritone saxophone, but I never did that for all county. I was first chair saxophone multiple times. I had solos within all county jazz band. It all seemed great. But despite months of practicing, screaming, and crying, I was never perfect. A point off here, a point off there, can make the difference of a lifetime. I've always found myself to be an art enthusiast. Though my physical artistic abilities are limited to, stap to sappy stick figures, I can still make a mean paper airplane. But let's go back to physical art. And by physical art, I mean drawing, painting, sculpting. Here's an example. Let's take a look at this painting here. Let's give it a grade. So what do we think about this painting? Any hands? Symmetry's a little off, no? Symmetry's off. Okay. His face isn't straight. Face isn't straight. Maybe it's not proportionate. Mm -hmm. I could agree. So what do we just do? We just graded art. Does anyone see the juxtaposition here? Now by what standards did we compare it to? How can we truly and fairly define art? The artist may have thought that this was a perfect picture, a hundred in their mind. But in our eyes, it wasn't perfection. What constitutes perfection? An ideology so often discussed that it is seemingly impossible. How can art be a hundred or music be a hundred? We can give a kid a hundred for applying a mathematical formula to find Bob's financial growth when putting his cash into a bank that compounds his interest continuously. But isn't art supposed to be unique and beautiful and perfectly imperfect in the eyes and ears of the artist? We live in a society today that tries to box expressive freedom. We grade art, we say, no, you can't wear this, no, you can't wear that. We tell our kids that they can only color within the lines, and yet when a little Crayola strays off to the side, is the picture no longer beautiful? We grade music. A kid is doing NISMA, or some kind of musical evaluation, and a note is off. The instrument squeaks, the rhythm gets off. By this standard, is the song no longer music? Then the kid cries. We have just moderated his expressive freedom because we told him that his art was wrong. Music is not meant to solely exist as black dots on a page. Music is different for every person, and the way that each person expresses their art is not to be graded. Grading merely makes a child robotic makes a child self-critical, and makes him or her judge every note or every drop of paint by society's standards. We are told that this is the answer, not that. Today's young adult students are always under the burdening pressure of following the status quo, adhering to formulas, and proceeding with caution into the ways in which we express ourselves. Our worst enemies are the numbers on the pages, the grades, the scores, the ranks. Mm -hmm. And when one does not follow that formula correctly, failure ensues. This striking metaphor follows suit in academics, fashion, college admissions, you name it. We are told to look a certain way. Do not show shoulders, shorts must roll past your thumbs when your arms are at your sides. And by this, 
society moderates the expressive rights of today's adolescents. Being pulled out of class to be scolded by higher ups for shorts being too short or for shoulders showing then decreases one offers one's opportunity to education due to one's attempt at expressive freedom. We live in a society where leading astray from the norm is punished and in the world of formulas, creativity is revolutionary. It does not take a genius to plow through a common core course. Memorize the formulas, memorize the dates, and you'll get the 95 average, depending on the amount of dreadful 3 AMs you're willing to sacrifice to your grades. But to step aside from the rest of society, to make a change, to make art without boundaries or rights and wrongs, that is revolutionary and that is ingenious. We are told that memorizing formulas will bring us success. But what is success without knowing who you are? A formula will not help one to find his or her potential, but changing the world, asking valid questions, jumping outside of the box, finding where to improve instead of just being scolded, the insurgence of a fixed society. That is ingenuity at its finest. Thank you.